Over this past weekend, from December 16th to December 17th, Friday and Saturday, myself and some other great friends and members of this ragtag group of hackers that I keep rolling around with hosted the NomCon CTF, or Capture the Flag, for 2022 EU. The conference itself, or NomCon, was hosted specifically for, hey, Europe, but the competition, the CTF, was open worldwide, available for anyone to play if you just wanted to sign up and get into the game. Uh, there were a whole ton of challenges. We posted about 50 or so challenges alongside a little scavenger hunt so the sponsors could have some love. But what I wanted to do is record some videos and showcase the challenges that I wrote. Uh, I didn't actually get a whole lot in this game. I think I was at maybe five or so because I was kind of busy these days. But in this video, I'd like to dive into one of the challenges and hopefully keep rolling out with some other videos showcasing uh, the challenges that I created. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. Before we dive into the video, here is a quick note from today's sponsor. Zero to Auto offers in-depth and quality training on all things malware analysis and reverse engineering. You learn to cut through malware samples, understand the threat landscape, and automate your workflow. Within the training, you get access to 25 hours of video content covering cryptographic algorithms, initial malware stagers, malware evasion techniques, core malware functionality like for banking trojans, worms, web injects, and more. You dig into the exploitation process and learn what exactly is needed for professional threat intelligence. Included with the course is a 10% discount on an IDA Pro named license or an IDA Home license, a three-month premium plan to the end dot run sandbox and access to an exclusive discord server where you can collaborate with other students get support for training material and receive new malware challenges right now the course has over 1500 students registered and always have access to new malware to cut up and learn from of course the training comes with the final exam and a course certification with both the theoretical segment and a hands-on practical challenge where you reverse engineer custom malware and craft a report based off of your findings. The Zero to Auto training comes from some seriously big names in the industry, to include Vitaly Kremez, Daniel Bunce, and Jason Reeves. I'm sure you have seen them sharing incredible research and threat intel, and this is your opportunity to learn from some of the best. Check out the links in the description to jump into some Zero to Auto training right now, and get 20% off by using the code malware at checkout. If you're perhaps looking for something slightly less advanced, they're also in the process of remastering their original beginner malware analysis course, which pre-registration is now open. If you head to offset.net slash beginner, that O being a zero, you'll be able to register early for the course and grab an early bird discount. Huge thanks to Offset Training Solutions for sponsoring this video. Alrighty, hopping into my computer screen here. I'm inside of my Kali Linux virtual machine and I'm online at ctf.nomcon.com. This is where the game was. You can see Nomcon EU CTF 2022 over this weekend from the past dates. Uh, fantastic game, I hope. I really think a lot of folks had a lot of great fun, uh, learned something new. Congratulations to the winners, by the way. Wreck the line, uh, Ares or Ares, X Cube Mastery and Advanced Primate Threats taking home the top three spots. Uh, there were some sweet prizes that were available for those. But uh, honestly, I think a great game. I think we had about scrolling down a thousand teams on the game board. And ultimately, we had cruising to the admin panel about almost 3000. You just registered with maybe a little over 1500 teams. So super sweet. If you actually take a look at the score distribution between the number of teams, the number of challenges that were solved, this was uh, kind of a hard competition. It's interesting if I actually move back over to the challenges, uh, the number of solves that are available between the warm ups category and then the rest of the categories is a severe drop off. You can see, hey, almost a thousand solves for a lot of the warm ups, but then we get into double digits, maybe some triple digits for a lot of these other categories. And, uh, had players really hit the wall, I think, right after the cliff of warmups. Anyway, in this video, I'd like to showcase the MMORPG challenge. By the way, these challenges will still be available for this week. Uh, we'll take the infrastructure offline soon, but wanted to give some time for more players to still play, practice, learn, and get the write-ups together. Anyway, let's dive into MMORPG. This prompt here is my friend is trying to learn how to code, so she made a text-based adventure. It might still have some issues though, and ultimately, I ranked 
ranked this as an easy challenge, although it only had 19 solves out of all the players that were participating. Uh, so we can go ahead and start up the instance and we'll wait for that to begin. But there are some files to download here. We are given this attachment. So I'll go ahead and click on that, make sure that fires off for me. I see that download. And then we can interact with this challenge. I can grab this netcat command. It'll open up my terminal, hit control alt T on my keyboard, and let's zoom in to go ahead and control shift V to paste on the terminal and then connect to this thing. It says, welcome to my text-based RPG. You can enter one to play, two for help, and three to quit, just to validate these things work. Yep, okay, three looks like that quits and we lose connection here, uh, no other input. I'll go ahead and control C out of that. Of course, two for help, you can see a rope playing game. I'm assuming that's supposed to be role playing. There's a typo there. Look, here's the fun gimmick. I did not write this massive ginormous thing. I gotta be honest, I completely just ripped this off of GitHub. I found some poor fella's code over on an open source repository and thought, you know what? Hippity hoppity, your code is now my property, right? That's the good old sweet stuff. Uh, on your adventure though, you may choose to be a warrior, archer, or mage. Which do you choose? And this is all fake all simulated, all not real, all just stuff you could click around or enter some inputs and do different things. And they're cool. And they now made it die and throw up. Some interesting gimmick, I don't know if you're noticing in a couple of these output error messages, you may or may not be able to see it. Uh, this is on the server, by the way, right? We're connecting to the remote instance with Netcat, uh, getting at least an idea for where this game may be. We're in slash home challenge for presumably the user that we're running as. Techspace RPG is the folder and then all of this stuff. But there's no inclination as to what we're doing with Python here. And that is why I wanted to give players the source code. So uh, let me go ahead and play with this. I'll make a directory for temp, I'll call it RPG. Let's CD into that directory and I'll go ahead and move from my downloads folder that MMORPG that we just downloaded. It is a seven zip file. You can see that extension there and we can run file on that just to verify. A Little bit of a bigger thing, so maybe it takes a second here. Seven zip archive data and you can of course use seven ZX to extract that. And now it extracts all that here in the current directory. If I hit LS, there is all of our stuff. So I think what most players will do is sort of a knee jerk reaction. Hey, let's check out what that server.py shows. Here it is. Zooming in here, here is our from text-based RPG.play. We'll import play. And then if we have a little like normal module guard here, if the name is equal to main, then we will run our play function coming from this module. So we could get into that and note that this text-based RPG is a Python package there. You can see the underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi. I've heard those called uh, dunder functions or you know double underscore, right? Dunder as a shorthand word for that. But of course there's more in here. Play, of course, is probably where all of this is defined. And then I'm gonna assume most players probably fell down the rabbit hole here, kind of exploring, kind of reverse engineering, digging into all this stuff that might be present in this RPG. That's why this challenge was called MMORPG for a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And this is just a bunch of stuff. There's just a bunch of filler fluff code. Again, full transparency. I just stole this off the internet. Uh, the gimmick here that I wanted with this challenge was just a simple thing. I honestly couldn't decide if this should have been a warm up or a miscellaneous challenge. If anything, that's why I put it as an easy noted miscellaneous challenge because there was one small tidbit that I wanted folks to be able to get into. If I head back to my terminal here, you'll notice that there are more files other than just this text-based RPG uh, and the server.py. You are presented with the Docker file. So if anything, maybe I just wanted to drive home a point. Hey, maybe some players could get the big picture here and just look at how this container was made. It's very, very easy to just naturally fall into, hey, let's dig into what the source code says, even if it's a massive giant dump of all this stuff. Again, hey, I'm clicking around for all of these battle files files and interface and players and rooms. There's a ton of code to dig through. Uh, and that was truthfully all a red herring. Uh, the real gimmick here is simply the Docker file. If you take a look at this, and I'll set the syntax highlighting to bash so we have a little bit more color here. I'll turn word wrap on so that's pretty easy to see. But hey, starting from the bottom here, just to see how this thing invokes, we are using SoCat to host this, the socket cat, whatever you want to say. Listening on port 999, quad nine for the challenge itself. And then we've got Python rocking, setting up the server, 
in a pseudo terminal. Running as the challenge user, as we saw, slapping in the flag, setting the work directory, getting this all together, creating the user for it. But you might have already seen it. The immediate red flag, the glaring thing that should stick out to us, hopefully, is that this challenge is using Python 2. And as you note, as we were clicking through the server and you got this play function here, take a look. Uh, inside of this play function that we might define for the game, everything that we do to print all these things out, we go ahead and spit this here. But our interface variable, if you wanted to trace all this back, if you really wanted to, without the knee-jerk reaction of just trying stuff here, let me see if I can find that source code for the interface. There it is. We can go ahead and get, uh, get command. That's this script here. Get command is a function that defines all of this. It spits out all these list options, ends up using get input to go ahead and receive the input, and then traces this or traces it as needed. Uh, but get input.py is defined here, calls input with the predefined prompt. At least we have some comments for, again, this random code, uh, and that grabs things from built-in methods and input underscore. So input underscore provides all this from more of the garbage and nonsense of this application. But now we know, okay, we're tracing back again to built-in methods. Built-in methods just sets input underscore to input. And that's a no-no in Python 2, right? Some folks, I, I, I know I have content on this, I know I have videos on this, so I'm sorry, maybe this is a big old boring one. But in Python 2, right? Oh, Python 2, add a comment there. Normally, you'll want to receive string input from the user by using the raw input function. That used to be what the world would use to get string input, but if you wanted a numeric value, you would just end up using input. And that would hopefully be able to return an integer or something raw, not strictly as raw input, because that would return a string as the user provided input, but then input on its own did something really, really weird. It would basically take what would have been returned from raw input as the genuine string and pass that sucker to eval, to evaluate code, to interpret it as, ooh, structures and commands and things that Python should do and actually execute. And that was the problem. And that, you know, that could very easily become some silly vulnerability because Python will willingly run what's provided as input. That's why everyone was using raw input because you did genuinely want to get string input from a user. But in case it just use old, old, old Python 2 input, there be dragons. Uh, bad news bears. Python 3, of course, uh, you would normally be rocking with regular input. I believe they got away with raw input, and now input itself is sane, it's safe, it's doing what raw input should have done, uh, or, or, or did do in Python 2 days, and now input is back to being the cool kid on the streets. Uh, I don't know if that was extremely confusing or not, but ultimately, press the I believe button with me here, input in Python 2, is bad because while we were just interacting with this thing, if I were to go ahead and play with it one more time, I did have a netcat command in here. If I were to just try to enter the values that I did previously, one, two, or three, those would be interpreted and used for this application as the number that I provided. But here's some weird thing. What if I were to try and use uh, maybe two minus one? So two would be the value like, oh, seemingly I'm providing first, right? So I'd request help for what the heck this thing is. But if I were to subtract a value of one, again, this is actually being interpreted and executed, right? So two minus one is just gonna give us one, as if we wanted to play the game. And it's gonna ask me, hey, which character do you wanna use here? So I could use one plus one plus one, and then I would suddenly be a mage because that all would add up to the value three. Does it show me that I've chosen to be a mage? Yes, it does. So you can see that is the issue, but now what do we do? What shenanigans should we get into? Well, we know that we want to basically be able to execute commands or compromise or take advantage of this thing, right? You could do a whole lot of different things, but we want to be able to mess with this server and catch the flag, right? So what if we were to import using some of those dunder functions or that double underscore, uh, that is something that you could actually use to get around or actually even take part in using the regular import statement in Python. But it does exist as just simply 
underscore, underscore, import, underscore, underscore. It's weird because following that, you call it like your regular function. You will use two parentheses there, and then we can import a module, right? Let's import OS. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this here. Uh, you won't see this returned out to us really, other than the command itself, because we need to actually enter a value that this application is expecting, right? But because we've done that, we basically have OS returned to us in that small command that we just ran within our eval statement, right? So what if I were to import OS and then try to run something, like run a command? I can use functions included within this OS module, like system, to run a system command. What if I were to pass in the arguments, again, kind of just noting the two parentheses here as a function call, in a string for the id command? What am I running as? Ooh, check it out. There's that command output. It just kind of spat out on the screen. You can see my UID is 1000 and this challenge user that we know from the Docker file is present there. And that's how we were able to track down. This is using Python 2. Just simply in the Docker file, all you need to take a look at, that's all you needed to see to make this an easy challenge, really. But anyway, let's go ahead and import OS and let's go ahead and run system to see what is present on the file system. Let's go ahead and run LS and there's everything we need. There's our Docker file. There's the challenge.yml as to how we configured and created this service. Here's our server.py. Here's the actual files for the code. But let's go ahead and grab this flag.txt, right? Let's do that. Import OS, system, super duper easy, cat flag.txt. And there is our flag. That is all that MMORPG needed, but I will admit, hey, maybe this challenge was a little bit evil <laughs> because I gave you so much crap inside of this MMORPG.7 zip, just the archive source code. You didn't need to dig through any of it if you just take a quick look at that Docker file and maybe had a closer look as to what was present there. So if we were to go hop back over here to MMORPG, we could paste in this flag. Uh, with the game being off right now, the competition is no longer running. I'm not sure if this will let me submit it. No, nope, it totally did. Excellent. So it is noted as correct. I have marked that green for my game board here. The solves haven't increased either one because I'm an admin and hidden on the scoreboard or because it's just not accepting solves for the moment because the game is over. Um, with that said, that was it. So hey, maybe a little bit of a quick video, maybe something simple. Uh, just wanted to maybe share that lesson if there even is one to pull from this. Look, you didn't have to make it all too hard. I'm kind of bummed, man, that didn't get many, many solves and it was rated easy because, you know, I, I just threw this little trick at you. I maybe gave you a red herring uh, and let you fall down the rabbit hole. But no, take a look at that bigger picture. Look at that Docker file whenever it's provided for a CTF challenge. Or in any case, whenever you got some application, you know, start at the top. Start at the big picture. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. Beware of Python 2. Just don't use it. Just stop using Python 2. Get out of that world and uh, come hang out with the cool kids for Python 3. Python 4? Someday Python 5? I don't know. What, what does the future hold for us? I know what the future might hold for you, hopefully, fingers crossed. Please, please press that like button, leave a comment to the help those YouTube algorithm stuff. Subscribe if you're willing. There's the little bell so you can get notified when other videos are coming out. And uh, if you're willing to support in any other way, Patreon and PayPal on the bottom. Thanks so much. Super appreciate it. Hope you check out all the links in the video description. And thank you for watching another video and hanging out. I hope you enjoyed NomCon CTF. We'll have more on the way.